law of nature says that we must keep our covenant. And obviously this means our valid covenant. When there is a successful transfer of right, then we have to comply. This says the third law. So the fool denies that this actually is a law of nature. Um, we can think of the fool's challenge here by starting with, by thinking initially about the state of nature. So in the state of nature, of course, because we have our right of nature, we can use our own judgment to determine which actions we believe to be best, and we can act on the basis of those judgments. So for Hobbes, our inclinations or desires determine what we think good or valuable, and we're entitled to act on that judgment. So we're entitled to act on our desires as they occur to us, as we feel their pull, so to speak, in the state of nature. And this means, the fool would point out, this means that we can uh, decide for ourselves, using our own judgment, based on our own desires, whether to make a contract or not. So sometimes we will decide that it makes sense to make a contract, a better way to ultimately satisfy our desires, and other times we'll decide not to make a contract based on our own judgment again. And it also means, the fool points out, that we can use our own judgment to decide for ourselves whether to keep our covenants or not. Again, sometimes it may turn out that in our judgment it makes sense to keep our covenants, but other times not. And we should decide whether to keep or break our covenants the same way that we make all other decisions based on what we think will be best, that is, based on what we think will best satisfy the desires that we have. So, the fool says, you can call, you can name the breaking of a covenant injustice, if you like, put that label on those acts. But the fool simply says that if that's what you want to call those actions, then sometimes those actions will be rational. Sometimes we will judge those actions, those unjust actions, to be best, and therefore we're entitled to act on the basis of that judgment. So this law of nature, this so-called law of nature that says, don't rely on your own judgment on each individual occurrence, whether to comply or violate a valid government, just comply, that's not a rational thing to do. You should not simply, as a blanket rule, keep all your covenants. You should decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether compliance or non-compliance uh, is rational given your desires, given your view of the world. Uh, your view of the so that's the fool's challenge. And Hobbes recognizes how serious this challenge is. Because without this being a law of nature, without the requirement that we comply with our valid covenants, there really is no way out of the state of nature. There really is no way out of the war of all against all. Because if the fool is right, and not only in the state of nature, but always, we will be acting and judging on the basis of our own desires on each particular occasion. And this basically means that we still have the right of nature. And it's the fact that everybody has their full right of nature that means that everybody is potentially in conflict with everybody else that there's no mechanism for resolving that, 
and we're in a state of war of all against all. Which I remind you doesn't mean we're literally fighting all the time, but that there's a potential for conflict all the time with no mechanism for resolution. So, this is serious. And uh, if it wasn't already clear by the name that Hobbes gives to the uh, character who makes this objection, he thinks it's a mistake, and he wants to reply to this challenge. Um, and he recognizes how important it is that he be able to respond to it. Okay, so questions about this. Questions about where we are, what the challenge is, why it's so important. Okay, so Hobbes' reply, I should say, um, Hobbes' reply is not so obvious. He says a number of different things. Uh, it's not entirely clear how they fit together. And it's also not entirely clear if he's successful. When I say not entirely clear, I mean there's controversy in the secondary literature about what precisely his reply is and whether it's successful or not. Um, so let's note a few things that he says in reply. Uh, that is on page 91. And he says, so he says, look, the specious reasoning of the fool is, uh, is nevertheless false. Um, so the first thing he says in reply, in paragraph 5 there, is this. He says, for the question is not of promises mutual, where there is no security of performance on either side, as when there is no civil power erected over the parties promising. For such promises are no covenants. But either where one of the parties has performed already, or where there is a power to make him perform, there is the question whether it be against reason, that is, against the benefit of the other to perform. And I say it is not against reason. Okay, so the first point that he makes is simply to remind us that what we're talking about here is a covenant in political society. When there is already set up, or when there is set up, uh, some kind of powerful enforcement mechanism. Because in the absence of that, the covenant, or most of the covenants, are not valid. So we're talking about valid covenants, which means that there's what, no reasonable suspicion about non-compliance on the other on the part of the other person. Uh, and that, well, basically means that we're in a political society with threatened punishment. The exception, of course, is when the other party has already complied you then don't have a reasonable suspicion about non-compliance because they did already. And this is, so this is like the, the prisoner of war case, or the, the robber case, where they've already let you go, and now you do have to comply. But Hobbes seems to think that mm, this isn't really going to occur in the state of nature. It isn't going to occur very often. Um, so, the case that he's really going to be dealing with is when we're in political society. Or more precisely, because the case that he's really worried about is the one that creates political society, the one that actually, the agreement, that actually gets us out of the state of nature. So in that case, I mean, uh, that case is a kind of hybrid. There's a sense in which it starts in the state of nature, but it itself creates the conditions for its own enforcement. So there's going to be one very special covenant that, so to speak, starts in the state of nature, but creates, but it itself creates the condition for its own enforcement. Now that's the one that's going to create a common. Okay, so, so that's the one that really he's worried about. And the point here is that there is an enforcement mechanism created. 
and it is something that's going to be creating political society. So Hobbes is just reminding us that the question of compliance, the question of the rationality of the third law of nature, is something that applies in political society. Is that clear? Um, then he says, just continue here in the uh, paragraph on page 91, he says, for the manifestation whereof we are to consider. First, okay, so here come really big reasons. That was just kind of a reminder we're, t we're talking about compliance, the rationality of compliance when there's an enforcement mechanism. And now he says, first, that when a man doth a thing, which notwithstanding anything can be foreseen and reckoned on, tendeth to his own destruction, howsoever some accident which he could not expect arriving may turn it to his benefit, yet such events do not make it reasonably or wisely done. So his first point is this, that when we're making an assessment of rationality of a course of action, we do it from the point of view of deliberation, from the point of view of anticipation, where we are never certain what the outcome will be. We're never absolutely sure what the outcome will be. There's always some uncertainty about what actually will happen in the future. And so it's important to recognize that an assessment of the rationality of one choice or another needs to be made from an anticipatory point of view, from the point of view of not knowing for sure what the outcome will be. And that's, and that's even the case if you make, a, make an irrational decision, but get lucky, get away with it. So if you make a decision that in anticipation is a foolish choice, but because of some unanticipated fortune or good luck, it turns out that you're, you get away with it, that still does not make the choice rational. Because the proper perspective from, for assessing rationality of the choice is in the anticipation of what's most likely. You can see he's setting up for allowing the possibility that, in fact, somebody might get away with breaking the covenant, but he's going to argue it's still not rational from the point of view of deliberation. Because it's possible somebody might get lucky, as it were, and not get caught, but that's just dumb luck, not what they should rationally choose. Okay, so that's the first point. Second point is then he says, uh, is, that, is that clear? There's a lot of word salad here, but that's the point. Okay, secondly he says, in a condition of war where every man, uh, wherein every man to every man, for want of common power to keep them all in awe, is an enemy, there is no man can hope.